Welcome to season two, episode six of A Story Club, Global Politics and Cultures, brought to you by Bulletproof Podcast Formula. My name is Dr. Kurt Megan, and I'm the Public Relations Officer of the United National Congress, the official opposition party in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. This is a unique venture, streaming simultaneously from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, Dehradun in India, and San Francisco in the United States. We speak with people from around the world, trying to understand different issues and problems relevant to my own country, Trinidad and Tobago, but also to people in sometimes very similar, sometimes very different situations, cultures, histories, politics, sociology, etc. The goal is to learn from each other, to build networks, to widen our perspectives, and to work for solutions in our distinctive context. Today's episode is entitled Crime and Punishment. Is the Norway model applicable to Trinidad and Tobago? Crime rates vary widely from country to country. Trinidad and Tobago has sadly become one of the most murder-plagued countries in the world, measured on a per capita basis. This is like many of its Latin American, Latin American neighbors and some of the more violent Caribbean countries like Jamaica. Other Caribbean islands and Latin American countries, on the other hand, are remarkably crime-free. Uh, Norway, too, has one of the lowest crime rates in the world. Tied to this is its unique prison system, which has prisoner reform and reintegration at the top of its agenda. In the 1990s, violent crime in the U.S. was reduced drastically by different crime prevention measures, most notably led by Mayor uh, Rudy Giuliani in New York City, who led the world's most impressive and important turnaround efforts. So the right policy changes can have dramatic effects. So what are the various crime prevention measures undertaken in various countries? Can the success of models in Norway, for example, be applied to Trinidad, which is a very different society in many ways. Specifically, what is the prison situation like in Trinidad and Tobago and Norway? What lessons might be learned? Is there anything that we have done right in Trinidad and Tobago that others might learn from? Joining us this week to discuss these questions are Tom Eberhardt from Norway and Jayanti Lachmidial from Trinidad and Tobago. Tom Eberhardt is the governor of Bastoy Prison in Norway, known for being one of the most successful and humane prisons on the planet. Bastoy has a completely different model for their prison, with the focus being on rehabilitation. Jayanti Lachmidial is a senator in the parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. She was a former prosecutor in the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, the DPP, and continues to practice as an attorney at law. Welcome, Tom and Jayanti. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, so enough of me talking with that long introduction. Let me ask you to elaborate uh, more on yourselves and, and, to, uh, and to let our listeners know. L let's start off by maybe telling our audience how you became interested in criminal reform, you know, why you became interested, and what was it that sparked your passion? We'll start with Tom first and then Jayanti. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me in this podcast. Um, I've been working in corrections in Norway for, I think, uh, nearly 28 years now. And I started off as a, as a prison officer in, a, in the central prison of Oslo, a high security prison. And uh, I think what kind of sparked my interest uh, in a little bit more than correction, but uh, also in the direction of crime and punishment is I kept seeing these guys going in and out of uh, prison uh, year after year, the same guys, uh, and with you know, little or uh, not any improvement at all. Uh, and what we did at the time was merely just locking them into the cells and letting them out on the streets after uh, they have completed their sentence with a plastic bag and a, a really small amount of money. And then we always knew that uh, most of them would come back uh, just within a couple of months, maybe. Uh, and they more or less lived the life in prison, uh, 
for um, many, many, many years. And I think that, well, I think that was, first of all, a waste of taxpayers' money. Uh, it's a, a huge waste of human potential. Uh, and it doesn't add to the safety of uh, the Norwegian neighborhood. So that kind of sparked my interest. And uh, after working in correction for a while, uh, I applied to be the governor at Buster Prison, as I really felt that the philosophy behind that prison kind of met me uh, with my own philosophy that we should focus on rehabilitation and having the people coming from prison become that good neighbor for everybody. Because that so Bastoy, is excuse me, so, sorry, just to clarify. So Bastoy what, uh, is a different, uh, follows a different model than the rest of the um, prisons in Norway, is that correct? Uh, not so much anymore. Uh, I think uh, from the, the midst of the 90s, uh, and especially from the beginning of the year 2000s, the correctional uh, system in Norway has more or less uh, moved in the same direction as Boste. But I think Boste was uh, the first prison to emphasize on you know, creating this good neighbor. So now I think uh, all our 40 to 50 prisons are more or less operating with the, the same philosophy. Uh, it is about rehabilitation. Uh, like eighty percent. So you were kind of comparing the experience that you were in whatever prison you were at, and and right. So I understand. Okay, please go on. So um, uh, after a while uh, working in Boston, uh, which I really really enjoyed, uh, I saw that um, you know uh, corrections is one of the few areas in in the modern world where we still more or less punished the same way we did in, uh, in medieval times, right? We have prison in some places, we have capital punishment, but no one ever stops to ask, okay, does it work? Does putting humans behind bars for a lot of years, um, does that help on the criminal statistics? Don't, do, does that help on the safety of our neighborhoods? And I think for a, re, re, really a lot of countries around the world, the, the simple answer is no, it doesn't help. But I think that the thing is about, uh, or the difficulties about correction and crime and punishment is that that really addresses a core emotion among the general public, which is, which is the feeling of revenge, right? And to reason with people's emotion is, is quite hard. And I have mm. to say for myself that if somebody hurt my kids, you know, I would be really, really mad and I would want some kind of revenge. And in our, my country, it's the, it's the state, it's, a, it's the government that are doing the revenge, and it's the court that sentence people uh, to a punishment. Uh, but by doing so, as a taxpayer, I um, assume and I demand that they do that uh, uh, in the best possible way for the general public. And that is not necessarily to lock people up for decades and throw away the key and treating them disrespectfully. Uh, because I think as a taxpayer, in my best interest is to have people coming from uh, our correctional system that has received some work training, that has received some, uh, um, some education, but most of all, that it actually have been treated with respect. Uh, because if you uh, treat people disrespectfully year after year after year, what the correctional system then will do is actually, in my mind, to release people that are acting like, you know, ticking bombs. Right. Because they haven't met respect for years. I, I, I want to ask you something about in your story. So if you are at another prison that, that wasn't following the same philosophy as Bastoy, and then you apply to be the governor of Bastoy, which mm. um, sounds a little strange to me. So if you could, ex because if you're going to be governing a, cis, uh, a, a prison, that has a different system and philosophy. So what, did you have to go through training or, or what, um, like how, how, how would you achieve in a leadership position in an mm. entirely different system, if I understand what you're saying correctly? Yeah, you can say the system is more, more or less like, but I think the most of my career I've been working in high security environments, in high security prisons. And I kind of, you know, uh, worked my ranks as a sergeant, lieutenant, captain, and then I was a warden at the, medium security prison. Uh, and then I got the chance to apply to Bostoy, which is a low security prison. And I think after uh, we have been following the philosophy of Bostoy for years, uh, I was kind of thrilled 
when I was able to, to go out there to be the governor. Ah, understood, understood. Uh, if I could bring in a giant at this point. Uh, could you tell our <laughs> listeners um, from around the world, uh, you know, how you became interested in criminal reform and what was it that sparked your interest and why? So, um, you know, my interest in prison reform is actually, I think, a, it's interesting, it's a total reform of, of myself and how I thought. Um, at 23, I joined the office of the DPP as a prosecutor. I was extremely young, I was extremely naive, um, having been raised in a very, um, you know, standard middle class type environment. I'd never been exposed to um, criminality um, per se. Yes, I knew people who were victims of crime, but I never knew a criminal. Um, so I think I had a very one-sided approach. And then as a prosecutor, you you sort of, you see the criminal as the enemy and you, you embark upon this um, career at a young age where your mindset is punishment. And then over the years, I had cause to actually hear some of the stories behind how people ended up where they ended up. I also interacted and I encountered, um, and there's one case in particular that stayed with me of someone who had been falsely accused, but had been denied bail and remained in our, what we call our remand prison for almost six years on a false accusation of sexual assault. And this was a completely innocent person. And I had cause to, you know, when the, when, when the victim, alleged victim recanted and so on, um, I saw what that person went through. I saw how the system really did not preserve the presumption of innocence um, in a way that was fair towards balancing the need for society to feel protected against the rights of individuals. And when I started to delve more into constitutional law and human rights law, I really identified prisons as one of the most unjust um, systems. As Tom has rightly said, we are still operating a prison system that is akin to what existed in medieval times where they lock you in the tower and you're not allowed to come out almost on the say-so or hearsay or allegation of someone. Um, you know, I, I studied um, literature at A-levels and I read Richard III, whose nephews were locked away <laughs> in the tower. And, and sometimes that's exactly what it feels like right now because you, you, there's a perception created in the minds of, of those who have the power to do so. And based on that perception and their judgment, and of course, I'm not saying that they don't exercise their judgment fairly, but it's on a limited set of facts sometimes and on preliminary facts and on preliminary evidence that... Um, persons are deprived of their constitutional rights to liberty and freedom and the presumption of innocence. And to me, the presumption of innocence must mean something. And for it to mean something, even if you have to be deprived of your liberty by due process of law, the, the conditions under which you are being held by the state in order to protect society must be at a particular standard so that your rights and your presumption of innocence isn't completely, isn't, is, it, it means something. So that's where I got interested in prison reform. I feel that we have serious challenges right now. And I think that the level of criminality that continues to exist, despite all of the things that we try to do, um, I think that a lot of it can be attributed to our failures when it comes to prison reform. And I think that, um, you know, better prison reform and identifying root causes of criminality and trying to, and, and having a reformation and, 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 and you know, uh, um, a, a system of, you know, Tom mentioned the word respect. Can we say that we treat any person, whether convicted or accused right now in our prison system with any level of respect? And how can that respect and giving dignity to a human being, even though they are, awaiting trial on an accusation, regardless of how serious that accusation is, um, can that actually lower our rate of recidivism? Can we actually make an impact on criminality and what is continuing to be a, a trend in our country of persons reoffending? And I think that that's where my interest particularly lies because it's not so much just about the rights of an individual, but it's society's collective um, you know, safety. Are we, are we ever going to be safe as a society if we continue to run a system that creates, uh, that, that, that really um, creates a situation where people are likely to reoffend? 
So um, uh, everyone in our society has to look at it like that way. It's not just about punishment, but it's about your future safety when this person re-enters your society as well. Yeah, I, I want to address this and, and get it off the table for some, for some of our listeners, I'm sure, uh, uh, especially in Trinidad, <laughs> who will be saying, listen, you all are just bleeding heart liberals, it's ideology. You care more about the rights of the criminals than you do about the rights of the victims. I'm sure you've, you've heard this plenty of times in your careers. And, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I mean, and, you know, and a lot of these people who say this, you know, have not come face to face with, with some evil people. I'm sure both of you have, have come across as well. I mean, I'm sure you've dealt with, with probably real evil in a way that other people have not even observed. Uh, so I'd like you to, to sort of bring, uh, th th you know, commentary uh, from that perspective, uh, just to let people know, you know, you're not talking from some theoretical point of view of, of everybody, um, you know, is, is theoretically equal, but, but, you know, it comes from hard experience. Um, Tom and then Jayanti. Yeah, uh, interesting questions. Uh, and first of all, I have to say that, uh, all uh, across the Atlantic, from Trinidad to Norway, uh, we are faced with the same allegations. Also, uh, you know, being accused of you know uh, being liberal and being especially soft on crime. But I always answer to those uh, that criticism that uh, okay, I'm not absolutely not soft on crime. Uh, I firmly believe that uh, crime should be used by some kind of sanction uh, and punishment. Uh, but I'm uh, not soft on crime, but I'm soft on the general public. Uh, because I know, uh, and I think that, you know, pretty evident that uh, if uh, we are uh, merely focused on the element of revenge uh, in the punishment, uh, the ones we are really punishing is the general public, uh, because what these people in prison needs is rehabilitation. And I think the first assumption a lot of people are doing are, you know, dehumanizing the ones that actually are in prison. They are stuck they stop um, being someone's son, someone's brother, someone's father or mother for that matter, uh, and they become uh, just a prisoner, right? So we are dehumanizing them. And when we are dehumanizing someone, uh, it's much easier to treat them disrespectfully uh, because we're kind of removing their face. And I think the general public also tends to think that our prisons uh, is full of evil. And as I said, I've work, been working 28 years in, in corrections and I think, I think I can count on maybe like 10 fingers uh, all the persons I've met that are really truly evil. But the big majority of our prison population, uh, and I would say not only in, in Norway, but all, all, all through Europe and maybe a lot of other countries as well, they have other things in common uh, other than uh, evil. And that can, is I, that can I interrupt you here as well? To, um, you, you gave an excellent story in another interview I heard about your son visiting and his remarks after. I think it, it will fit in perfectly with what you're saying here. Yeah, uh, well, at Boston, I have uh, my youngest son is, is eight years old. And it's like when uh, he's a little bit sick, he cannot go to kindergarten or school. So either I have to stay home or I have to go to work. And I decided to take him to my job at Boston. Uh, and after a while, he got hungry. And uh, I said, okay, let's go down to the kitchen and the boys there will fix you some lunch. Uh, and I was standing there uh, watching them and these guys in the kitchen, all the inmates say, hey, come on, uh, let's fix you some lunch. And he made lunch together with three inmates. And these three guys, they were con convicted of murder. Uh, and in my eight-year-old son's eyes, they're all thieves. He doesn't know the concept of murder, right? Because he's so young. But when I was watching them, I just, it suddenly struck me that my son has never ever been to a safer place than right now. Because contrary to what people might think, uh, when you look at the statistics, for instance, in Norway, most of the homicides are, and the, or the murderers, they do one murder and they never do it again. Uh, and uh, like 85% of the murders in Norway are not premeditated. They happen uh, there and then for some reason where drug is involved, high state of rage, alcohol, um, uh, and, and things like that. So and I felt it was safe. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, and, and you said um, that, that he, he asked, uh, you, you took him to a prison and he was interacting with people and he asked you, well, where are the thieves or something? Well, isn't yeah, that 
exactly. Uh, because uh, as I was saying, in I think in kids' sites, they have this perception of people in prison as they see in you know Donald Duck magazines, cartoons, and so on. Someone that looks evil, looks bad, right? Uh, and they have that assumption. And I think it's not only kids that have that assumption. Uh, you'll find that in grown-ups as well, because that is based on, at least in my point of view, in the fact that we are dehumanizing uh, the prisoners. Uh, and we forget that they are also someone's father, someone's son, uh, or, or mother, right? Uh, and I think that um, a kid work, walking around in a prison uh, is kind of the perfect example of how he takes his views on criminals. Uh, and he doesn't make that fit to the people they actually meet in prison because the general uh, prison population they are there because obviously because they have done some crime but they're not basically evil some are but the big majority they are poor uh, they have um, uh, not managed school they have uh, not been uh, working uh, they have some kind of uh, mental issue uh, big or small uh, so they have this long list of losses that eventually has, has led them to prison. And if you are just punishing them by using the element of revenge, we will uh, leave them at the gate of the prison upon release, even worse than we took them into prison. Yeah. Uh, and people need to know that. Right. I mean, I, I think what you're seeing too as well is, is like besides the, the you know 10 or, or, or whatever percentage of people that are truly evil, for the vast majority, I mean, when you meet them, because, you know, sometimes I've had that experience. And it's like, you know, but for the grace of God, you know, I, that could yeah, be me. You know, uh, you know it, it's, it's just, you know, uh, these the circumstances when you see them as as people and, and, and speak to them. But Giant, how, how would you um, address and how have you addressed these, you know, criticisms that you, you know, right to the criminal, you don't care about the victims? <laughs> Dealing heart liberal. Yeah, I mean, let me give you a story, and it comes back to exactly what you said there. And that's something I you remember my grandmother, she used to say that all the time. But for the grace of God, there goes I. Um, there was a, a boy I grew up with. He's she's related to me through marriage. We are the same age, but his father was an alcoholic. They were poor. Um, you know, the, his father couldn't keep a, a job, so they were always moving, um, couldn't pay the rent. His mother was uneducated. Um, so he didn't do well in school. He underperformed in the education system. Um, by the time he was 12 or 13 years old, he stopped going to school. He also, you know, dealt with a lot of violence in his home. Um, he also, I guess, it was introduced because of where he lived, introduced to drugs and so on at a very young age. And um, he ended up, he's basically someone who's in and out of prison right now. Now, because of our um, relation through marriage, I would have grown up playing with this boy like we played cricket in an empty lot near mm -hmm. to my grandparents house like he's he's someone he he's literally we started off on equal footing and our paths simply diverged and that mm -hmm. to me is a perfect example of why I can say that I believe I don't believe that the, and as, as Thomas said he's been in, in prisons and for so long maybe he met 10 people who are really evil I don't think I've ever actually met a real like an, an evil serial killer type person in Trinidad. Every criminal, and I've prosecuted and seen many of them pass through the court system that I've dealt with, I don't think any of them were born evil. Um, I don't actually think that on a personal level, I believe that anyone is born evil. I think people have mental illnesses. I think people have a lot, um, and the vast majority of people in our um, society, Kirk, I think really it's a societal problem. It's poverty, it's self-esteem. It's your home environment, it's alcohol abuse, it's they themselves being exposed to a lot of abuse. I think a lot of our, um, you know, I, I did a lot of sexual offenses um, when I was a prosecutor and you realize when you hear the things that these people do and when you see them and you see the way that they are, you realize that there's something wrong in their upbringing that creates the, the monster that people like to talk about. But, you know, it just it's the same way that it takes a society, it took a church, it took a good family, it took aunts and uncles, it took a neighborhood, it took a good school, it took all of these things to make me who I am. Equally, it took a whole society of the opposite of what I had, 
to create that person you know to create that boy who when he's in a relationship with a woman now and he and things don't go well he will quicker use violence against her and 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 that kind of thing as opposed to being the type of man who would sit and have a conversation so he's been locked up for domestic violence he's been locked up for you know all different types of things robberies because of course poverty now you end up um you know we have a serious problem in this country i don't know if people realize it but that persons who are unemployed um basically living below the level of you know poverty and so on they have a lot of children they have a lot of children because we don't have um uh, uh you know enough focus on family planning and, and and things like that and so when people are then pressed to provide for their families um and for their children they turn to crime it 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 it's it, it's it's almost you know there, there's also a lot of people who have the societal influence that teaches them to dislike people who are successful and who have they turn the the haves and the have nots against each other and that's really sad because we as the haves um tend to look at the have nots and treat them with a, a level of disrespect and think they are criminals and then the have nots resent that branding and that treatment of them and so they they become even worse criminals than they are and Tom says they were leaving them at the gate worse and they came in that is that is if you had to to give a one line synopsis of our prison system in Trinidad that would be it most people exit worse than they have come in and particularly where my concern lies is in the remand prison because people go in presumed innocent awaiting a trial date and sometimes because of the delays in our criminal justice system when they exit it is 5 and 6 and 7 years later that they have exited they have not worked they have not provided for their family their marriages have broken down they are, they have no relationship whatsoever with their children um they have a, a record um, um they've been branded this is a small society everyone knows um that they have been to prison so after 7 years of living in a 8 by 10 cell with 10 other people using a slop pail which i don't mean to be too graphic but a slop pail is basically a bucket that sits in the corner of a cell that you use as your toilet for sometimes up to 16 to 18 hours a day until it can be emptied when you live under those conditions sleeping on a floor for 7 years what do you think is going what do you if that person was not a criminal when they went in i can assure you there's a great possibility that they will behave criminally when they come out and um i got well, Kirk, you would know about this i got a lot of flack um in the political arena and in the media about a matter that i was dealing with um where someone we have an automatic no bail for murder in trinidad and it is a contentious issue and um of course it's on appeal so i don't want to say too much about it but unlike other developed countries that have first degree second degree third degree murder and that kind of thing murder is murder we have murder we have manslaughter and oftentimes even um manslaughter is something you can plead to but you're charged for murder unless you can prove premeditation um you know lack of premeditation and pro a provocation and all those kinds of things early on in the game but the point is this the person who sought to challenge the rule on no bail for murder was set free after about 7 years because the evidence against him was so poor but he lived under those conditions for 7 years no judge no magistrate no one had the power to say this case is taking so long the evidence is so weak against him that he should be out on bail and face his charges and fight his matter in court for those seven years there was an automatic rule written into our law that he must stay in the remand prison for those seven years now where is the benefit of society in a case like that where is it forget the bleeding heart for the person yes it's really sad what he is in where is the benefit of society of having a man who's gone through everything that i've just explained there now back out into our society what do you expect from him what are we how are we keeping ourselves safe by creating those situations and those persons to be back out there in our society you know and um, i think that that's a question that that really troubles me and that's why i think people have to realize that it's not about the individual and it's not about the bleeding heart it's about where we're going as a society when you you basically you're creating the perfect storm you are yeah. you're creating the perfect scenario to have people to breed criminality within our prison system right. so this now takes me to tom uh, perfectly um 
could you describe this system for us? I'll, I'll, I'll frame it for you to, to give you some uh, taking off point. Like, you know, from the outside, you hear things like, oh, well, it's a, you know, it's like a first class hotel and flat screen TV. And I don't know if I heard you say silk bed sheets, <laughs> but uh, you can clarify that. Um, and uh, they said that, you know, people will commit a crime just so they can go inside the prison because they don't live like that outside. So, and But then there's other things that I hear that's very interesting, and you can clarify for me if this is correct, that, that the way Bastoy prison and perhaps the, the whole system, you can clarify that in, in Norway, is, is that it sort of recreates life outside. So there's, you know, work, there's uh, there are shops, there are, you know, people learn responsibility. And, uh, and, and so you have this kind of thing about replicating outside life, inside the prison. So when people leave, they have a sense of responsibility, perhaps that they maybe not even didn't have when they came in. So if you can clarify that for me, tell me where I'm right, tell me where I'm wrong, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, I can certainly try. Uh, well, I think I have to start by uh, explaining a little bit about uh, the rules for our correction system and the laws. And actually in uh, our laws, it is stated that uh, um, the purpose of prison in Norway is actually two things. One is that we should uh, uh, um, do, uh, carry out the sentence as decided by the court. And that the only punishing element uh, in our um, uh, prison sentence is the loss of freedom. Uh, and the other uh, thing is that uh, uh, we should start by uh, from day one, they are in prison uh, to help them to a life, uh, live a life uh, without crime after the release from prison. And that should start from day one, uh, as we see it as important. Uh, and when you're uh, outlining uh, you know, flat screen television and uh, silk bed sheets and so on, well, we don't have silk bed sheets, actually. It's something I, I think I said during a TED talk at some point, uh, just to make an example. But um, for instance, flat screen television, well, how do you, where do you buy a you know, huge television these days? It's not possible. You only can buy flat screen televisions, right? So I think we have uh, our prison system is divided into merely uh, two different types. It's high security and it's low security. Um, and we have some core principles that applies to our correctional service. And one of them being what we call the prin principle of norm uh, normalization, which states that the everyday life in prison should be so close to the life on the outside as possible. So when we are designing new prisons, and I have to say most of our uh, prisons are built in like uh, between uh, 1860 and the year 1900. So they are really, really old, but we operate them quite differently than we used to. But um, so we design our prisons now, uh, the new prisons around this principle of normality, because we have to learn, uh, because some of these people in prison have never ever uh, lived what we call a normal life. Some of them are poor, they have been living on the streets. Some of them have been you know, gang affiliated uh, and has never lived what we call an A4 uh, regular life. So we need to learn them that. Uh, so we wake yourself up in your cell, you eat your breakfast, you go to school or work in another building where you are able to learn something, have a certificate, uh, work training, uh, and you go back to your units uh, and you go, another place to do spare time activities and then you are locked up for the evening at maybe uh, 10 o'clock p.m uh, so the days are also designed around that fact uh, and i think to understand that the, um, how the prison looks on the inside uh, whether it's you know silk bed sheet huge flat screen television for the people incarcerated that doesn't mean so much because what they are really experiencing are the loss of freedom. And for a person that never ever has been deprived of freedom, it's not even impossible to try to, to um, explain how that will feel like. Because if you have been, for instance, in remand prison, as uh, Yayanti is saying, uh, and you sit there for months after months, um, in a, you know, maybe a tiny cell uh, with you know, no TV, no pictures, no nothing. You have so little impressions from, uh, you know, to have your mind working. So uh, what is happening is that after a while, that cell, you know, in your mind becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. 
uh, and uh, I have, you know, made bets with friends of mine that, uh, okay, I can lock you up in the, you know, most expensive suite in the most expensive hotel in Oslo. And I'm quite sure uh, that uh, after a while you will go on the calling and say, let me out because I have the key to that suite. Uh, because eventually that television doesn't matter. Uh, the fine curtains doesn't matter. Uh, even the gold uh, on the armature in the, in the shower doesn't matter because all you can think about is that you actually have no freedom, no freedom at all. Because I will lock them out for like one hour of fresh air every day. I will decide when they can go to take a shower. I will decide when to eat, what to eat. I almost food, uh, spoon feed them, right? So that's how little freedom they have. And by having so little freedom, responsibility, uh, and trust over years, that is horrible. That really destroys human. But that also is how strong people feel the loss of liberty. Because I think maybe that's the, in most countries, that's the biggest uh, thing we can have as humans is, is freedom. And you don't have that in prison. Right. And, and so, so this recreation of, of the outside world inside the prison system is, is fascinating. Mm. So, so, in other, so when they come out, you, you find that, that they can actually be good neighbors and so forth. I've, I've heard you speak about this before. Can you just elaborate a, a bit on that? Yeah, uh, I think, uh, as I said uh, earlier, I think uh, my, my mission here is not to be soft on crime, but as I said, just to be uh, soft on the Norwegian neighborhood, you might say, mm -hmm. uh, because I firmly believe that, you know, in, in, in my countries and in most countries in Europe, you won't find ghettos. You won't, we don't place our um, uh, unwanted people, you know, far out in the woods. No, they are going to live in our neighborhoods uh, and they are going to, uh, you know, have some relations to my family, my kids, my kids will meet the, their kids and so on. So I think whatever we do in the corrections needs to, you need to always to bear in mind that these people will be our neighbors. Um, uh, so we need to train them to be those neighbors. Um, and I think um, um, uh, you said something really, uh, you said a lot of good stuff uh, earlier on, uh, but something I really uh, struck me it's, you said something like, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, right? And I think that's something missing in a lot of modern societies is, you know, the willingness to accept that, okay, if you're living in a neighborhood, we are a part of a neighborhood and we should take care of each other, right? Uh, and that also goes for people coming from prison. And the really funny thing in, in my neighborhood, because Norway is a small country, uh, a little bigger than Trinidad, but at least it's still a small country, but... I know people living in my neighborhood that has uh, spent several years in prison, but my other neighbors, they don't know that. And they treat him equally to all other neighbors because there's no stamp in his forehead, you know, saying that, okay, uh, uh, earlier in prison person. And that's how it should be. And they can't tell the difference because they have received training in prison on how to be this good neighbor. And I think that's exactly how it should be as well. All right, excellent. Well, Jayanti, I mean, I, I know, you know, we've talked about how the problems, how bad our uh, system of, cr of crime and punishment is in Trinidad. But, you know, I do want to say that, I mean, you know, um, while I, I don't want to bring uh, Tom into our local politics, but certainly when the UNC were in power, this is just a statistical fact, crime, serious crime, murders went down. It's the only two times um, that, that we've had reductions in crime and murder. What, what are some of the things uh, that were done? I know you weren't part of those administrations, um, but sure. you know, it, maybe you can, you can talk about some of the things that were done here in the Trinidad context that actually helped to reduce crime, murder, et cetera. Well, I mean, again, it, it's a lot of economics. Uh, I don't know, when people are, are you know, um, hard pressed for um, financially, things don't um, you know crime increases there's just it's just proportionate you see it so um two things that i think we did um in our past administrations as a government is we focus a lot on education and we focused a lot on creating employment opportunities um job opportunities are always you know it's, it's a, a means to to reducing the crimes of what i call you know poverty 
poverty breeds criminality. There's there's just a lot of it that happens. So, um, you know, when you have, uh, when the country is doing better, when you have more job opportunities, when you have education, because there's something very frightening that I don't know that people have realized where there's a statistic now that says because of the lack of access to online education and all of that during the COVID pandemic when our schools have been physically closed, there are 2,000 children who have dropped out of the system. Mm. And I'm sorry to say, Say it and it sounds really bad but those are 2,000 potential people who can run afoul of the law because they they will not have opportunities for um you know good jobs they would not be able to um achieve their dreams their goals their self-esteem would be affected um they would see their peers moving on i don't know if people realize how how difficult it is for a child, for a teenager, um, particularly, and this is where we see a lot of kids, a lot of a lot of um, what we call lifetime criminals who spend their time, their entire life in and out of our prison system. It starts in the teenage years, um, and, 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 and we people, don't even see. And ju hmm. just to elaborate that, and for people who who don't realize, there was a time in our system where twenty percent. Of, of the children after 11 years old were not sent to secondary school. And then Correct. another 60% were sent to half day shift schools. And right. that and revolution, all of that exactly. Yeah, we changed, we had a revolution in education under the, the 95 to 2001 um, UNC government. And that focus on education, I think went a long way. But of course, when you have people who are now educated and you want to find jobs, you have you have to have that out there. Not everybody can't be a doctor and a lawyer. I've always said so. Um, and so our education system has to also provide a way that people can live a respectable and decent standard of life by focusing on trades and vocational type, um, you know, jobs and so on. And, and those things are really, um, are really things that would contribute to, to bringing down crime. If people are not hungry, they would not be driven to commit robberies. I, I want to ask you this one slightly controversial thing here. But we, we also have things like community policing, uh, sure. the joint military and police, we, and, and the efficiency of policing and bringing it down, all that was good. But then there was also a thing, the death penalty. Our attorney general at the time was a human rights lawyer. And then when he became attorney general, he yeah. uh, he was so he used to argue against the death penalty and then he enforced it because it was on the laws and but a lot of people believe that part of that strict enforcement which which was really one big case and then another one after and that's all that, that was done but that case was drama yeah. for five years right um and do you think that that, because many people say that, look, you know, when that was being prosecuted and all these things were being done. down, yeah. yeah. Do, do you think, um, uh, in your opinion? Yeah, and it goes back to our mindset and, and I guess a bit about some, some cultural factors. If you talk to the average man on the street in Trinidad and ask them, well, do you think X will pay the price for his crime, knowing that he's guilty, you might get the response that the justice system is so slow, we haven't been really enforcing the death penalty, so they will get away. Um, you know, again, I have my personal views on death penalty. I, I'm not a supporter of it, but um, it is the law. So if it is the law and it is not being enforced, then you give the overall perception that persons aren't, you know, that the strict enforcement of the law doesn't stand. Where, 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 whether that law is the death penalty or any other law, there's a general perception in our country that the justice system, that the police um, service is corrupt, that people can buy their way out of facing um, sanctions. So as I said, it's not so much what the sanction is, but it's the mere fact of people having to face a sanction and being held to account for, for their actions that I think, um, you know, and, 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 I, and that's, again, maybe people can't articulate it in that way. So what they say is, well, nobody hangs, so if, if we were hanging. So I think that the, the hanging of um, people and the implementation of the death penalty, it, it, it wasn't so much about the fact of the death penalty, but it was more about the fact of showing that the government of the day was serious about seeing through the process of sanctioning. If, for example, we had, we did not have a death penalty, but we had a system in place whereby your trial had to start and finish within a year, right? If we had 
a system in place where um, you were mandated when you came out of prison to do a minimum number of years on parole, where you were subject to electronic monitoring, where you were, people might see, still see that the sanctioning process would, and not just have the laws on the statute books, but to have it actually implemented, rolled out and working. Um, so I think that that's where, you know, enforcing the death penalty had some impact. I mean, of course, it's also a, a very, on, on the mindset of, you have to remember criminals or people involved in criminality, I should say, they aren't, they aren't, um, you know, they aren't inherently bad people, but like all people, they sometimes they will fear consequences. Um, so even if they are all, even if they are suffering from a mental illness, even if they are suffering from just extreme poverty, even if they have, you know, a corrupted mind because of the circumstances under which they grew up and their own experiences, they still like every other human being fear consequences. And if the consequences seem very dire and stringent and they see that it's being enforced fairly across the board and, you know, um, as a matter of course, then I think it would have an impact on them. So regardless of what the punishment is, I think that the, 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 the thrust has to be in making sure that people see that the justice system is serious, that it works, that there's no such thing as, um, do you know how many people in this country are charged with criminal offenses and they basically depend on the police being slack and inefficient and not coming to court to have their matter dismissed? They mm -hmm. actually don't even care sometimes that they are arrested for sometimes a serious criminal offense. They almost know to themselves that the system is so slow and so inefficient that sooner or later the police officer will get transferred to another division somewhere and not attend court as he ought to. And that when the matter is set down for trial, you know, it might most likely get dismissed or something will happen or the evidence wouldn't be ready because our forensic science center isn't efficient. And people basically depend on the inefficiencies in the system to get away and to not not feel threatened by the sanctions that they may face right, right. tom that's a problem right that, let me bring you back in the conversation in terms uh and and to to tie some of these things together i know you've um, been working in many other countries as well you know you're you're an, if i'm right you're like an international spokesperson kind of pr for the system in norway and you are actually you have worked and you are presently working in the United States and, and other places. I'd like to hear your experiences about, you know, the transferring of the Norwegian model to other cultures, because obviously, just like um, I think we were talking, I can't remember if it was on air or off air when Jayanti was saying, you know, it's a white man uh, thing here, you know, so people say, oh, this is a European liberal uh, thing that's not really for our culture. You know we're harsher here and, and stuff like that um i i'm i i really like to hear your experiences uh yes. in other contexts I, I would like to specifically if i could ask to yeah. hear from tom as well about how how is you know taking that approach as you take in norway in, in the prison such as where you are um how did it go over with the public how did you win public support for for having a more humane system of prison um of, of imprisonment and on focusing on reformation as opposed to simply punishment because i think that's where our biggest challenge lies right now well i think uh, i'll start with the last question um and i think uh to answer that correctly i have to go actually back to the second world war uh because a lot of the politicians that became key politicians during the 60s 70s and early 80s those were people that were uh, incarcerated because of their resistance work. Uh, some were Jewish, uh, Jewish, uh, uh, and they were in concentration camps and prisons in Germany during the Second World War. And that led to that they uh, became uh, quite liberal when it came to crime and punishment because they have experienced prison themselves. So uh, when we started our reform uh, in the uh, last part of the 80s, early 90s, um, that wasn't a really big debate. Uh, they made a, a quite new and radical white paper uh, in the last part of the 70s that um, uh, led to a lot of uh, the, um, a lot of discussions, both in media and in, the, in our parliament. But then we found that uh, after the noise had settled a little bit, that uh, in the next 15 years, almost all the items in that really radical white paper had been um, uh, taken place in our service within the next 15 years. And 
for the next white paper, next white paper that came in um, uh, in the nineties, uh, which was even more radical uh, about uh, um, emphasizing how we should work with rehabilitation and so on. That white paper went through the parliament uh, with absolutely no debate. So we have a general political agreement in our country from the far left parties to the far right parties that our prison system should uh, operate in more or less uh, this direction. Uh, so it's not uh, up to political debate also. And I think also when it comes to press, uh, obviously in a lot of the countries I've been working, I'm going to address that in a little bit, but uh, our press, even the tabloid press, uh, are uh, have had editorials, I think, within the past seven years that always have been so in support of our uh, correctional service whenever some um, uh, incident had been happen happening. So I think over the years, we have been working strategically with, uh, with, the, with the press uh, by being transparent. We have always invited the press into our institutions to um, see the, uh, what the conditions are like, explaining to them why we are doing our politics the way we are doing. Uh, and they have more or less been helping us um, uh, giving out that message to, uh, to the general public. Uh, uh, and I think we have among the majority of our um, uh, general public a quite wide understanding on why we are operating our prisons the way we do. You will find individuals in the general public that are opposed to that, that would say, for instance, that now we should have the death penalty in Norway. Uh, that's the only thing that works. But it's quite easy to kind of fend off that kind of debate because uh, as uh, Kirk uh, was mentioning, I've been uh, working in a lot of prison systems just recently. I, the last couple of years, I've been working with the uh, University of California, uh, San Francisco, uh, to help uh, reforming the American uh, prison system in some states. Uh, and one of the things we're working there on the political level is how to get the message through to both the pol politicians and the general public, what's in their best interest, right? And some of the things we're doing in our prisons in Norway is not really Norwegian things, it's universal things. Like, uh, and it's not even um, uh, uh, very expensive because you know, treating people with respect, you know, that's basic and it doesn't cost a dollar. Uh, it's about, you know, human interaction. Uh, uh, and uh, whatever we do, we see to all our, you know, partner countries that, okay, you can steal whatever uh, you see in our correctional, correctional system, all our methods, it's no secrets, take it, but you have to translate, uh, translate it culturally to make it fit your country. That applies for the United States. I've been working in Romania, the Czech Republic, and in Malta. Uh, and they all have stolen bits and pieces to fit into their prison system. Uh, uh, but they have to do it their way and make it kind of their tool. Um, so my advice would be to uh, you guys at Trinidad and Tobago that you have to work with the press, you have to work with the general public to make it accepted that uh, uh, the, it's in their best interest to actually re rehabilitate people uh, because the prison sentence itself, the loss of freedom, is actually more punishment than really anyone would know that has been to prison. Uh, and people need to know that. And I think also we, we need to give them examples when you know, the debate is uh, as strong as that. You have to, for instance, make examples that are close to them. Okay, let's say if your son was sent to prison, what kind of conditions would you like for your son to have for 10 years in order to come back to the general society uh, uh, as a reformed guy? No one would say uh, like 10 men in a cell with a bucket as a toilet uh, and disrespectful treatment for 10 years. No one would believe that that would make their son a better person. But some people tend to think that it will make the other person, the other person's better persons, because they are dehumanized. But you don't dehumanize your own kids, right? So, um, but yeah. I think again, all the things we do are universal. Uh, I see that in Romania, in the Czech Republic, uh, also in the Republic of Malta, and there are countries that are uh, very different from Norway, both politically, uh, economically, uh, and socially. Right, right. But uh, Giant, I'd like to ask you from your perspective, working with the G, uh, DPP as a prosecutor, as an attorney, and as a senator, as a legislator now, um, 
I, it, I, I'm assuming you think that the, the Norwegian model in many ways could and should be uh, applicable down here, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. And, uh, and uh, what, what, ask, uh, it, what, what, what do you think would be, you know, some of the easiest things to implement, yeah. what, what might be hard? I, to, I actually, to yeah, great. I mean, yeah. I, I actually have like a, a three point plan in my head that if ever I was given the opportunity is what I would do first for prison reform. Actually it's about four points, but let me take it through one by one very quickly. Um, and yes, and the aspects of the Norwegian model. And as I think as Tom rightly said, every country can take elements of the system and adapt it to its own cultural, to your own cultural um, scenario, to your environment, to what you're facing. The first thing I would do is that I would have a first time offenders program. And even if people are required to be under um, lock and key, as we say, I would treat with first time offenders differently um, and in a softer, not softer in terms of liberties and so on necessarily, but I would have a, 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 a real drive and focus in an actual physical environment that is different and separated from hardened criminals to try to get that process of reformation. Once someone takes the first step on the pathway, you, you try to divert them off of that. We had um, an inquiry and it was widely reported in the press here about gang affiliation and so on. And the number one place for gang recruitment in Trinidad and Tobago is the prison. So we have first time offenders entering the prison system and actually being recruited into gangs. You may not have been in a gang, you may, be, you may have been guilty or accused of committing a, a petty crime, um, but you can't access bail or whatever it is, and you are in the system and you are recruited into a gang. So first, a first time offenders program would be my, one of my key elements that I would want to look at. The second thing that I would look at is really a system of a total comprehensive offender management system when you exit the prison system. As Tom has said again, these are your neighbors. But you see in Trinidad, we have, uh, and Trinidad and Tobago, we have this mindset amongst the upper um, middle class type society that well, those aren't my neighbors. They don't live in my neighborhood. We have very, very defined social structures here where some people think that these things don't, don't affect them because those people coming out of the prison aren't going to be my neighbor. But you know what? The reality is that they may not live in your neighborhood, but if they commit a life of crime, they are coming to your neighborhood to commit the crime. So it is in your best interest to, to ensure that they are reformed. So I would have a total offender management system coming out. That includes ensuring that while before you exit the prison system, whether it's on parole or completing your, your sentence, that you, are, you acquire some sort of a skill. When you come out of prison, I would have some system to ensure that you are gainfully employed and to assist you with finding employment. You can be permitted to access social services and social um, support um, for a, a period of time, but you have to use the skills that you are you acquired. So if you opt to learn electrical work or plumbing or carpentry or something while you're in prison, and that's a skill that you have, when you exit prison, you cannot simply put them out of the gates and say, go have fun, do what you have to do. That's a recipe for reoffending. We know that people with criminal records do not have an easy method of finding a job. So create systems where they are there. And, and, and yes, we acknowledge that you're an offender, but we're employing you to do A, B, and C, even if it means construction work in the public sector, whatever it is, but assisting them with getting jobs. The third thing that I would do, um, and this takes it back to the beginning, is I would have a serious um, program through our Ministry of Education in the schools to identify children at risk and to treat with them early on, whether it's at risk because of self-esteem issues, your home environment, poverty, whatever it is, but try to nip it in the bud. So that's one, that's another system that I think I would have. And finally, I think that um, the, while the middle of the story now is while you're serving your sentence or you're on um, remand and so on, um, it comes back to what Tom says, treat people with a little more dignity and respect, um, acknowledge. It comes back to acknowledging that people who I always, I, there was a phrase someone told me one time that every, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Why can't we treat every person in our prison system? Maybe some of them will fall short and disappoint us, but can't we treat every person in our prison system as having the potential for a future? And if we do that, I think you would have a lower rate of reoffending. I think you would have people actually showing promise. I don't know, Kirk, if you saw recently that there's a prison debate team 
and people yeah. are actually learning debating skills. But if you learn those skills in the present, because of course we want to do things and we're doing it in the present, but what are we doing when they come out? So it's a holistic system. It's targeting the youth who are at risk. It's targeting the first time offender. It's dealing with them while they're in the prison, treating them with respect, trying to shape the right person who will be exiting the system. And then when they exit the system, man helping them to manage life and get back on track. It, it cannot be easy to exit a prison anywhere in the world, but particularly in Toronto Tobago, in a small society where we, everyone kind of knows each other and, and, and know your reputation, to find a place to live, to, to get back in touch with your family and to reconnect with your family, to um, find employment. All of those things have to be managed because you can, you can give a man a job, but if he's living by himself and he's depressed because his marriage has broken down while he's in prison and he's not allowed to see his children and he has no relationship with his parents or his siblings and he's ostracized by society, doesn't that also create the perfect storm, as we say, for someone to perhaps become an, an offender again? Well, so excuse it's a, it's me, a, Dianti. Uh, uh -huh. We've reached the, the one hour mark of the program. It's, it's a fascinating, fascinating discussion. I, I really, really in, enjoyed talking to both of you about this. I'm sure our audience uh, enjoyed listening to it as well. Uh, but before we go, I just want to give you a quick, let's say, you know, 30 seconds each, uh, you know, a takeaway for the audience uh, before you go. Tom and then Giant Teeth. What, what, what would you want to give uh, the audience? I have to say that. Well, I think uh, when it comes to crime and punishment and prison politics, I think I would like people really to take a step back uh, and uh, look on the subject with uh, in the eyes of science and not the emotions, uh, because science is actually what is going to help them uh, and not the emotions. Uh, emotions is important, uh, and the feeling of revenge is you know something we have as human is an important um, uh, emotion. But when it comes to punishing people, uh, and that is the only man, uh, element that will only make uh, uh, our situations as uh, the general public much, much worse. Thank you. And Jayanti? I mean, my takeaway would be that, um, you know, even prisoners still have human rights, that um, if you've never had the unfortunate experience of um, being in, you know, at odds with the law, it doesn't mean that it cannot happen to you or to your child or to someone that you know. And you would still want people to enjoy human rights. And my, my key takeaway, I think that I would like everyone listening to understand is that the quality of person who re-enters our society or who continues to live in our society has a direct impact on your standard of life. It's not just about the standard of life of the offender and about making life nice for them in prison or when they get out of prison. It's about your standard of life and your feeling of security and for society as a whole to move forward. Um, maybe we didn't talk about this a lot this time, but there's also, the, like I said, the economic side of it how much money the government has to spend in fighting crime and maintaining people in a prison could actually be reduced and be put to better things if we had better prison management and prison and prison reform. Well, thank you so much again. It's really been a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you so that's much. It. That's it for this week's episode of the Story Club Global Politics and Cultures brought to you by Bulletproof Podcast Formula. We were talking with our guests Tom Eberhardt from Norway and Jayanti Lachmidial from Trinidad and Tobago on crime and punishment. Is the Norway model applicable to Trinidad and Tobago? I'd also like to thank you, our audience, for watching and listening. Please join us again next week. And in the meanwhile, like, share, follow, subscribe, and tell your friends about us. If you're watching on YouTube, please also click the bell icon so you get notifications of when our programs are uploaded. Thanks again and see you next week.